welcome to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Michelle Anderson. I spent two decades working in equine media, and I currently create content and help veterinarians and businesses connect with horse owners through my consulting business, Cadence Marketing and Media. I'm a trail rider, dressage rider, and an at-home horse keeper. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and a pony club mom. Claire and I collaborated for years when I was the editor of an equine publication, and she was one of our regular contributors. We'd finish work, but we always had more to talk about. New products, new research, and our own horses. This podcast is an extension of those conversations. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding and caring for their own horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. While I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. With that, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the following episode. Top line is such a hot topic among horse people when it comes to equine nutrition. A strong top line not only allows a horse to comfortably carry a rider, but a horse with a well-developed top line is also pretty to look at. Like, I don't know, Claire, is that a weird thing to say? <laughs> I was having these visions of like being a 4-H kid and, and the halter horses that, you know, in our little local shows and how beautiful their top lines were when they were fit for halter classes. And that's what I think of when I think of a pretty top <laughs> I do think horses with a nice top line are pretty easy on the eyes, right? Everything kind of smoothly blends into itself. There's no harsh angles and they're just pleasing to look at, right? And I think they look balanced as well. I mean, even a horse that doesn't have great conformation looks better balanced overall and more pleasing to the eye if the top line is strong. Yeah. yeah. And I think if this top line also has, a strong top line has a youthful look to That's it true as too. Well. I think we're... Part of it is like a subconscious sort of response to the top line. It means so many things for the well-being of the horse that when you see a strong top line, I think without us realizing it's triggering a lot of things in our subconscious about that these are all good things, right? And when you see a horse that's kind of lean and angular and doesn't have a good top line, the the opposite happens, right? It kind of triggers a bunch of like danger, danger, alarm spells kind of thinking in your brain. Yeah, yeah. Because there might be a lot of things that might not be going quite right for that horse. When I worked in equine publishing, we always got a ton of questions about top line. Is it something that you get asked a lot in your consulting? It is. You know, and it's interesting because actually what I, it tends to come to me as is my horse needs to gain weight and I'll get picked. I'll either go out in the field and see the horse in person or they'll send me really good photographs of the horse. And oftentimes what I see is a horse that has really good like cover over his ribs. I can't see any ribs. Like overall, the condition looks pretty good. It's just like the neck, there's a bit of a step in front of the shoulder, like under the saddle area is a little peak that's kind of weak in the loin and over the rump. You know, when I say to that owner, like it could be a calorie component because that is a part of building top line. But, you know, I think actually it's not a calories issue. Your horse is not necessarily underweight, it's lacking top line. And those are not one and the same thing always. It may not be a weight issue. When I think weight, I'm thinking not enough calories. When I'm thinking top line, lack of top line, It may be calories, but more often than not, it's to do with the protein. Is there enough protein and amino acids in the diet? Yeah, and I think maybe we should back up for our listeners who might not know what we're talking about when we're talking about a horse's top line, or if they do know what a top line is, they may not know what makes up the top line. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so for me, it's really literally the top of the horse, right? From their ears all the way down the top of their neck, where their mane is growing out of their crest, you know, over the withers, under the saddle area, across the loin, down the rump to the top of the tail. So for me, it's that whole muscle chain that covers that whole area. And there's all kinds of really long worded named muscles in that area that if it wasn't quite so late in the day, I might remember like Longissimus dorsi, I think is one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's one of them. (laughs) You know, and then all the ligaments that are involved, like the supraspinous, you know, anyway, whatever. Anyway, but all those those fancy Latin named pieces of the anatomy. But yeah, I mean, that's what we're talking about is that whole muscle string that 
you know, as a dressage rider, I think of it sort of originating at the withers and going forwards to the ears and starting at the withers and going backwards to the tail, right? Because that's sort of how we think about the horses balanced well, as we're, you know, but yeah, it's all those muscles along the top. Yeah. And I think that an important thing to think about is that those muscles and that soft tissue is around the horse's spine. Exactly. And we need a strong top line because let's be honest, horses actually did not land on this earth to carry humans. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know like, who was that first person who thought, you know, I have an idea. <laughs> now that must have been a day, you know. Right, exactly. Can you imagine the stories around the fire that night? Yeah, yeah for sure. So... But, you know, joking aside, it's really important the horses have a strong top line, especially if we're going to ride them, because that's what actually provides the support that we sit on. And it's very important for the health of their spine, that we're not sitting on their spine. We're sitting on the muscles that surround the spine and thus protecting the spine. And it's very important that horses use their backs correctly so they can carry us. From there, it goes all the way down their legs, all the way down to their feet, right? I mean, it's like if they're carrying themselves properly and carrying us properly, they're far less likely to get injuries of the lower limbs and things. And so it's, it's really important. So when we were talking about assessing a top line, you talked about like people think that the horse needs more calories and is thin or you know it's top line or vice versa. What are you as a nutritionist looking at when you're assessing that top line? Yes, I mean, I look at, you know, as part of when I'm doing my condition scoring. Now, you know, condition scoring, as we've talked about in previous episodes, was developed by Dr. Henneke and as a scale for assessing condition. And it really is, look, that's looking at fat cover. So we're not really looking at fat cover when we're assessing top line because top line should be muscle and not fat. But I think the condition scoring part is, is important because standing back from a horse, you can say, wow, that horse has a lovely top line. And then you get up a bit closer and put your hands on it and go, mm, that crest feels a little like memory foam. That's not actually muscle, that's fat, right? And that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about, about muscle. And so, yeah, I mean, it is just sort of looking at, you know, running your hands over your horse, paying attention to, you know, does it feel smooth? Does it feel... You know, all the, the neck blend in the shoulder nicely. Like, do you have that slightly peaked appearance underneath the saddle or is the back flat? And it's not uncommon for a horse to look quite nice, tacked up and working. And then you take the saddle off and you're like, wow, like you actually don't have great muscling under the saddle area, which I always think is kind of interesting. Why is that? But yeah, I'm looking at all those sections. And then again, as I, I stand behind a lot of horses and look at horses looking forwards from over their rump, and again, from the side, they can look quite nice and round. And then you stand behind them and they're really peaked, right? And their sort of SI at the top of their rump is really kind of prominent. And actually, they don't have a lot of muscling on their rump. So it's really important to look at horses from the back forwards. I can't tell you how many times I've found weird asymmetries too. When you have a horse standing square and you stand at the back of them and look forward that I've pointed out to owners and owners are like, really? And I'm like, yes, come and stand. And they're like, whoa, I had no <laughs> idea. I'm like, does he work better <laughs> one way than the other? Yeah, yeah it was a fast. I actually helped a client she actually sent me photographs of her horse and I said look I have like the glute muscles on this horse are very asymmetric and do you have any issues going one way or the other and ultimately she had, she had a saddle fit issue but she didn't realize she had but when she went back and looked at her saddle and stuff the horse wasn't using itself and its saddle didn't fit properly yeah also going back to the Henneke body condition scoring so that's the the one to nine nine is obese one is nearly starved to death and even though and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Sometimes I, I talk about things like I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> but if you are looking at the fat deposit, you know, the adiposity over the horse's body. But when a horse is on the low end of the henneke, they will lose that muscle mass because they're starving and they're using the muscle to fuel their body to survive, to feed their organs. So that's, I think, part of that depleted top line that we see on thin horses as well. Yes, absolutely. And so normally at that point, they're also ribby, right? And looking thin overall. And then that's what I say, like that's when you know that it's actually also got a calories component. The, the big part of that is we don't have enough calories in the diet. Yeah. We're going to get to the nutrition pieces of this top line puzzle, but you, you mentioned saddle fit. I think it's important to think about the things that affect a horse's top line that aren't the nutrition piece because it's such a, it's really a puzzle of getting the right exercise and care for the horse and the right diet. So saddle fit is one. You, know, you can have, if your saddle isn't fitting, you'll end up with atrophine in certain parts of the top line. 
I know I've seen that. I don't know if you've come across that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, a horse is not going to want to lift its back and use its musculature the way it's supposed to if, you know, it's got tree points sticking in its back behind its shoulder blades and that kind of thing. So no, absolutely. And and also, if the saddle isn't sitting balanced on the horse's back, then you're not going to sit balanced. So the horse is going to be carrying offset weight as well and it's not going to help. Yeah, whether you're riding in a Western saddle or an English saddle. When you look at the horse and the saddle isn't on the horse, you shouldn't be able to see where the saddle sits on the horse. Right. <laughs> like there shouldn't be like a depression in the muscles where the saddle right, sits. Right, exactly. That's sort of there. what I was, that's a good way of putting it. That's sort of what I was alluding to earlier when a horse can look great and then you take the saddle off and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the permanent saddle spot on the horse's back. That's probably not the way things should look and you should then talk to a saddle fitter about (laughs) getting something that fits you and your horse better. You mentioned rider balance. How do you think rider balance affects the horse's top line? I mean, quite a lot, to be honest, because they're going to compensate all the time to try and keep you in the middle of them. We're sitting on the horse over its center of gravity and it's pretty motivated to keep you there. So if you're trying really hard to fall off on the right-hand side all the time, (laughs) the horse is going to be the whole time going, can you stay in the middle of me? Can you stay in the middle of me? Like shifting itself over and like trying to put itself under the middle of you. So to do that, it's going to be tensing some muscles and not tensing other muscles and holding and muscles that are holding and not relaxing don't develop properly, you know? So yeah. 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 And for riders, I know we all were beginners at one point and being imbalanced is such a challenge when you're first learning to ride, but that imbalance then can cause the horse to hollow its back from having a rider balancing on them or it makes them use their bodies in ways that are detrimental to that top line. So I think instruction is good, practice is good, and fitness out of the saddle also can help those things. And it's something you have to work on your whole life. I mean, I've been riding for decades. I actually rode my daughter's pony out this morning. We're flooded out. And so I rode down the road bareback super fun. And I was practicing some lateral work bareback. But it was really interesting actually sitting on the horse's back and really paying attention to my seat and my thighs and like, where was my weight? And it was really fascinating playing like with my seat without a saddle and really noticing like where my weight distribution wanted to be. Very Mm eye-opening. So it's something you... (laughs) I was like, not always as balanced as perhaps I could have been as I was sitting there just, you know, (laughs) wandering down the road. So Yeah, I mean, we all need to work on our balance constantly, right? And being the most balanced that we can. And having a saddle that works with you and the horse is a really big part of that. Yeah. And so being able to exercise the horse throughness through the back where the horse is lifting in their stomach and using their hind end and and not having their their head pulled down. And it's just how we exercise our horses matters. It does. No, it does. And lots of other things matter too. I mean, I think with that, I mean, you mentioned that using their hind end. Well, you know, to really push and use themselves, they've got to feel comfortable through their lower limbs, right? So if you have a horse that has any kind of body soreness anywhere, whether it's arthritis, hoof imbalance, hoof-related pain, they're going to compensate in their movement patterns and that is going to impact their ability to develop good top line, right? So they have to be structurally sound, <laughs> Yeah. And you said hooves and I love hooves. <laughs> so, <laughs> I put that in there just for you. I know. So yeah, having good hoof balance really does help the horse use their body better. And you can see when they aren't using their body correctly, their feet will change. And, you know, it's chicken and egg, kind of like the top line is a chicken and egg between how they work and how they develop top line. And I think one of the hallmark issues is caudal heel pain, you know, the navicular horse. So that's the back of the, usually we're talking about the front feet. I was about to say, we we are very obsessed with the front feet, but so much is going on in the hind feet. I know. We need their hind feet as well. But on those front, I think those classic, like for me, I can see a horse that has caudal heel pain. Just I can see it just standing. If it's in the cross ties, I'm like, oh, yeah, that horse has caudal heel pain because the top line is in usually inverted around the withers. You know, they've they're holding their neck up because they have a shortened stride. And you'll see kind of this bulkiness in the shoulders. And that's to my eye. I have no scientific proof behind <laughs> that. That's just to my eye from from having been around these horses for 40 some yeah, years sure. and then working on their feet. So so with all of that, besides exercise, you have to fuel the muscles to build them. How do we build muscle on top line? Yeah, I mean, muscle is essentially protein, right? So if we're building muscle, we need protein to build muscle and making sure the protein quality in the diet is good. I rarely see diets that are too low in protein. However, I do sometimes think that I have diets that come in that maybe could do with a better quality source of protein. And 
you know, when we're talking protein quality, we're really talking about the amino acid composition that makes up that protein. Here's a fun fact. Horses actually don't have a protein requirement. Did you know that? Well, maybe. <laughs> Explain it. Explain it. I know. So we all, you know, we think about protein, we buy a bag of feed, you see crew protein on the label. But actually what horses really need are the amino acids that make up that protein. So I always think of it as like amino acids are the letters in the alphabet and the protein is the words in the sentence. You know, we'll have all the sentence itself, right? So you need all those amino acids to make the words. And that's really what the horses need, the letters in the alphabet. We just provide it to them in the form of a whole sentence or the words in a sentence, which they then break up to get all those individual letters back out. And so there are essential amino acids and essential amino acids are essential. They have to be in the diet. <laughs> the horse can't make them himself. But non-essential amino acids the horse can actually make so they can take a bit of this amino acid and a bit of a carbohydrate chain or whatever and stick them together and come up with an amino acid. So when we're talking about protein quality, the higher the proportion of essential amino acids in that protein, the better quality the protein is. And I think a lot of us are aware that like egg whites, like albumin is like really good source of protein. It's like a really high quality source of protein. And so that's why, because it has like such a high percentage of the essential amino acids that none of us can make. When you start looking at hay, then the percentage of those essential amino acids is considerably lower. So you said egg whites. And so did we, because we talk about fish oil with omega-3 fatty acids talking about egg whites, did we just jump to human diets rather than horse science? <laughs> yes, I was trying okay. to find something that maybe people, have, you know, like we're familiar with egg whites being really a good source of, you know, quality protein in our own human diets. But I do know some people that feed their horses eggs, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> but that, yeah, but when you get into like forages, the protein quality is often lower. And then if your forage is more mature, that protein is perhaps bound up with a bunch of structural carbohydrate and not particularly available to the horse until the hindgut where you get microbial fermentation that can break down that carbohydrate and release that protein. Well, by that point, you've missed the site of protein absorption because horses digest and absorb. They digest the protein and absorb the amino acids in the small intestine. And that part of the intestinal tract precedes the cecum and colon where microbial fermentation happens. So if your protein's all caught up in the structural carbohydrate, you've got to break that down with the help of the microbes first to then release the protein where you've missed the boat because you've missed the opportunity to absorb that protein, which was in the small intestine. So that's why we rely on things like soybean meal in feeds because it's what we call pre secally available protein. Like we know it gets broken down in small intestine. And it has a much higher percentage of the essential amino acids like lysine and methionine and things. And so that's why when you buy a bag of feed, you'll often see crude protein. And these days you'll see lysine, methionine and threonine and sometimes phenylalanine like broken out on the tag because those are the amino acids that horses seem to need the most. And they're all essential, like they have to be in the diet. So that's why those are on your feed tag. So, so when I'm thinking about building top line, I really want to think about, do I have a source of quality protein in my diet that's giving those essential amino acids? So I was kidding about the egg white piece, but I have seen whey protein listed as ingredients in yeah. horse feeds. And so is that part of this equation? Absolutely. So what's special about whey protein is whey protein has a high percentage of what are called branch chain amino acids. And muscle is made up of a lot of branched chain amino acids. Actually, the proportions of amino acids in muscle is predominantly branched chain amino acids. And so those are leucine, isoleucine, valine are the three that we think about the most commonly. And leucine is the big one for building muscle. So that's why a lot of the top line supplements you see out there or products that purport to help support top line often have branched chain amino acids in and specifically leucine. Many of them don't have enough to be useful. <laughs> So, you know, you have to read your labels and, you know, one gram of leucine is probably not useful. You know, you're probably looking at 10 plus grams of leucine per day. So those products are there. But, but again, there are supplements out there that have whey protein in them and that have a good amount of research behind them. And some feed companies and things have similar products and those are known to help support them. But oftentimes people that come to me with these horses are feeding a hay-based diet. They're feeding a performance feed and a senior feed incorrectly. And then they're feeding all these muscle things on top that they've got in supplement form. And we take all that away and just feed them hay and a ration balancer. And the ration balancer is 30% protein and is using soybean meal or something similar. And it's providing guaranteed amounts of lysine and methionine. And suddenly the horse starts building top line. That's where I'm going to start in that scenario. 
then if it still needs more help, then I'll reach for those muscle-specific branched-chain amino acid supplements. But people who are feeding commercial feeds properly typically are getting enough quality protein in the diet. But but there are times if, if you are and you're not getting the top line that you want and you've crossed off all those other things we talked about as potential issues, then reaching for a good quality top line support supplement is a good idea. When you're talking about feeding those concentrate feeds using the ration balancer, you're talking about as far as using them properly, it's the measured amount. So that's, yeah. So if the label says a thousand pound horse needs six pounds of this feed to meet its dietary needs, you need to be feeding to that recommendation. Right, because they're guaranteeing for your lysine and methionine and other amino acids at the correct amount when you feed that amount of feed. But if you're somebody who's just feeding two pounds of that feed, then you're going to be deficient in that quality protein they're trying to give you. How can you know if your hay or your forage is a good source of protein? Really, you have to get it analyzed. But the younger it is when it's cut, the higher the protein content is going to be. And the more available that protein is going to be as well. So if you've got a good leafy green hay, you should have a pretty good amount of protein. But again, you know, as I said, I rarely on paper, I'll have hay analyses where, you know, it'll say that this hay has 13% protein in it. And that's way, plenty, plenty of protein for working horses when fed at like 2% body weight. But the horse has a poor top line. And then you look at what's called the acid detergent fiber, which is a structural carbohydrate content, and it's like 38%. Well, that's pretty high and means that that hay is not very digestible. So what happens is, is in the lab, we grind all that stuff down and put it in a beaker and here's your crude protein content. It's not accounting for whether that's actually available to the horse during digestion or not, right? So you have to kind of understand how it's digested and made available to the horse in the actual world. I think... Because we have an episode about ration balancers and we talk fairly in depth about using those and I share that that's what I use to balance my diets. And I've been doing that since I first met you, which I think has been like 12, 13 years ago. (laughs) And I first started talking to over a decade. And that was the biggest change. The top line was the biggest change I saw in my horses because I would supplement with a vitamin supplement, but it was a a hay just wasn't providing enough protein, I don't think. And so it was a really significant difference that I saw in my horses once I started balancing their diet. So I think that is just another shout out to ration balancers can really change, change how your horses look and feel. So, okay, so misconceptions about protein. So we hear these. (laughs) Oh, there are several. Uh, Yeah, so what do you hear? You you have alfalfa is a higher protein feed. You hear that alfalfa makes horses hot. Because the protein... No, protein makes horses hot in general. But yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's probably the key one, right? And does it? No, I mean, it doesn't. But what happens is, is that when you feed higher protein, except in the case of a ration balancer, you're also generally adding more calories, right? So as the protein goes up, as the hay becomes more lush and the protein goes up, it's also generally younger hay and more digestible and more easily available and therefore is yielding more calories to the horse. So it's It's not quite as simple as that. Another one is protein and OCD in young horses. That one just won't die and go away. Explain what OCD is for those who haven't fed young horses. Bone disorders, joint disorders in young growing out horses. There was some research done in large breed dogs back in, I think, the 70s that suggested that when you feed high protein diets, those dogs are more prone to these developmental orthopedic disorders. And so everyone got, ah, I don't feed high protein to, you know, pregnant mares and big dogs because horses also get these disorders. Well, it turned out that when they did that research, they didn't what we call make the research diets isocaloric. So as they increased the protein, they also increased the calories that the dogs were getting. So it was not an apples to apples comparison. It wasn't only the protein that was increasing. And so when it was redone many years later, where they did keep the calories the same and only increase the protein, they couldn't reproduce the same results. And so it wasn't the protein that was causing the issues. It was the fact that they were overfeeding, you know, just feeding too many calories. So that's another misconception about protein while we're busting those. (laughs) And then for when you're feeding your horse for top line, once you make those changes, how long should it take before you start seeing a difference? I think you'll definitely see a difference in a month. I mean, the horse that I just recently purchased, we're getting him fit. He's not been super fit. And so we're getting him fit and he has, you know, needs to develop his top line. And I'm seeing differences in 30 days. Actually, I think I saw differences in about... 
I took some nice photographs, you know, so I could track his progress. And I would say at two weeks, I was starting to see some difference, but certainly by 30 days, I was seeing a difference. And some of that is the work. I do have to throw out there that sadly, don't build muscle sitting on the couch. I feel <laughs> shame, actually. <laughs> You can't be a bodybuilder just like drinking your whey protein no, shake. No, as I'm sitting here recording, having, <laughs> having just drunk a whey protein <laughs> shake. Yes, I'm not, I'm not building muscle as you and I are chatting just because I've drank my whey protein shake. But no, you have to do the work. So that's really important too. Um, you've got to stress those muscles and kind of make them, make them want to get bigger. So what are some conditions that might prevent a horse from building top line? We already talked about like saddle fit, maybe some foot issues, but what other problems or health conditions or diseases might lead to a depleted top line? And I'll just throw out my example. I talk about him a lot. If people have listened to other episodes, I have a senior gelding that I bred and raised and he has PPID cushions, equine cushions, and it's severely affected his top line. That condition really has a negative effect on the horse's ability to build lean muscle mass. So it can become a real challenge. And it's helped by being on the medication that's available if they need it. But they certainly are well served by being fed a really good quality protein diet. And seniors in general, we have very limited research specific to senior horses, but what limited research we do have suggests that they may not be the best at utilizing dietary protein and may need slightly higher quality sources of protein in the diet. And that's why many senior feeds are sort of 14% protein and have a little bit more higher quality protein in them than horses for diets for just your average mature horse. But the PPID horses really struggle. So it's really important to have their yeah. diets dialed in. I have a Michelle asked free advice question that's coming on. <laughs> <laughs> so for Jack, that's my gelding. He being on the percent, this makes his appetite a little meh. He likes eating his hay. He's very happy to eat his hay. And I'm really fortunate he's not insulin resistant. He doesn't have other metabolic issues. It's just the PPID. But he doesn't want to eat his ration balancer so much anymore. So what I've turned to is giving him some senior feed with a multivitamin but how can I make sure that he gets the protein he needs if he's turning his nose up to the ration balancer? That's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Like, do you go to the five or six pounds of the senior feed on your PPID horse that doesn't have metabolic issues? I mean, not if he doesn't need it for weight, right? That's the thing. I mean, there are some protein supplements out there, like two come to mind. You know, Purina has their super sport supplement, which is really high protein, but has a small serving size that would give him some quality protein, whey protein. And then I think it's Pro Elite have their top line extreme supplement and he might take to one of those, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know the Purina feeds tend to be highly palatable right. because they, they do a lot of palatability research. So I might try that. Um, I haven't tried that. So that, folks, if you're listening, that was a real question that I... <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. It's a good one. But now they are a challenge. And yeah. then, you know, other conditions that are going to struggle, nutritional, if your horse is vitamin E deficient, they're going to struggle to build top line because you need vitamin E to, like when you're using your muscles and burning fuel, you're, the, the byproduct of that is all these peroxidizes and oxidative products, and those can damage muscle if they stay in the muscle. So if you don't have enough antioxidants to kind of mop them up, then they're going to sit there. So that's what vitamin E, it's one of its jobs, is to help mop up all these potentially sort of cellular toxic substances that come about after work. And so horses that are deficient in vitamin E are going to struggle to maintain muscle mass and build muscle mass. And so when I see a horse that's really A-frame in the hind end, it often makes me think vitamin E. And just because your horse is getting enough vitamin E on paper does not mean to say it's not deficient. And case in point, the new horse that I just purchased He's getting about twice his daily requirement of vitamin E on paper from his feed. Just tested his vitamin E and it should be like normal ranges, like two to six, two to four, two to six, depending on the lab that you're using. I can't remember the units. And he's at 2.18. So he's pretty marginal. So I'm going to be struggling to build top line on him at that lower. I would prefer, we like to see our sport horses at the upper end of the normal range. So I'm going to be giving him some additional vitamin E to try and kind of get him into that upper range a bit more. You know, and then any of the conditions that affect muscle function can potentially struggle with vitamin E. So I think, you know, PSSM, 
the various different types of PSSM and MFM, polysaccharide storage myopathy, for those not familiar with it. Good job. I was going to wait for you. To I say. know, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> and then MFM is myofibrillar myopathy. And those horses can really struggle with top line. Yeah. I mean, those are the ones that always come to mind for me. Mm-hmm. And is shivers related to? I don't think of shivers as being so much. No, I don't think. I mean, those horses seem to develop top line pretty well. But yeah, I mean, possibly. I think of the swayback horse, so lordosis, it's uh, genetic. There's other reasons too, like brood mares who've carried lots of foals will have, have swaybacks. But if your horse is genetically going to be swayback, there's not a lot that you can do about it. It's you know, that you have the ligaments that hold the spine up just slacken with age. And that's your kind of, when you think of like the old gray mare. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> stereotypical gray mare with the sway back. That's your lordosis horse. And that's just something that, I mean, I think, I don't know if you've helped feed a horse with that condition. If you can help support it by supporting the muscles, I mean, I would think they definitely need their correct amount of protein. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, and that's where I think where a lot of your stretches and things come in. So like Dr. Hillary Clayton and one of her students, I believe, have a great there's a book called Activating Your Horse's Call that she is certainly a co-author on that book. And many of us know about carrot stretches and many of us do them wrong. <laughs> so they're extremely powerful. There's really good research supporting the use of carrot stretches for building what are called the multifidus muscles in the spine. And the multifidus muscles are little short muscles that connect one vertebrae to like the next vertebrae or the next vertebrae, three vertebrae down kind of thing. They just run like two or three vertebrae in length. And they are all the structural, they keep the spine structurally aligned. And they're really important, right, for structural soundness of the spine. And the research shows that doing carrot stretches properly keeps those multifidus muscles conditioned. And they showed on ultrasound that that was the case. And so even if you can't ride your senior horses or horses with lordosis, doing those kinds of stretches and getting them, you know, using their spines or whatever every day is really good. So I highly recommend that book to anybody that wants to help build top line from the ground, especially really useful horses in rehab too. I get that a lot. How do I, you know, he's on box rest because he's got a ligament injury. I don't want him to lose his top line. Well, it's not, you know, you can't, he's not working. So he's probably going to lose top line. But if you can do stretches and stuff in the stall, you might help minimize the loss. Yeah. And belly lifts, get in the horse. Exactly. Turn. Those similar kind of things. So that book has all of those different types of lifts and things. Yeah. And definitely read that if you want to learn how to do those correctly and make sure that your horse isn't just twisting their neck. Right. <laughs> exactly. No, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then other things that come to mind for building top line once they have the nutrition are things like lunging over poles, yep. hill work. Absolutely. Or when you're out riding. Yeah, hill work yeah. is really good. Actually, backing up properly, properly, rain back, not shuffling backwards, rain back where their legs move in diagonal pairs. And there is a difference. I, <laughs> I, I learned that yeah. the hard well, way in a clinic one time where somebody said, Show me your rain back. And I rain back. He goes, That was not a rain back. Uh, he's like each foot moved individually. They're supposed to move in diagonal pairs. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I say properly, it's like the horse isn't here. They just want to go right. backwards. But because <laughs> they're like, yes, but it's our idea of properly. Right. And yeah, this is the diagonal pair with the lifting of the yeah. belly and stepping back and then stepping forward without inverting. And the reason it helps when you back them up, they have to rotate their pelvis underneath them. And so in so doing, they lift the back. So it's actually, it's a very powerful exercise to do. And again, something you could do in hand. You don't have to be under saddle. So, well, that is all the time we have for today's episode about top line. We hope that we've answered some of your questions and helped you better understand how you can develop your horse's top line through good nutrition and proper exercise. Yeah, and if you have questions about feeding for top line or general equine nutrition questions, you can contact us at info at scoopandscale.com. And that's scoop and scale spelled out, scoop and scale.com. You can also find Claire at clarityequine.com. And please make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And we always love it when you share uh, posts on social media to your friends. It's a great compliment. For the Scoop and Scale podcast, I'm Michelle Anderson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us. 